the next uh, speaker uh, for us uh, is our close uh, friend, you know, Professor Bakri. Uh, she's a great uh, scientist. She's a consultant gynecological oncologist, peritoneal surface malignancy specialist, and she works in D-Lyon, France, in the university hospital. Uh, if you go back and see all the publications internationally in the field of uh, ovarian cancer that is coming, uh, you know, from that hospital, it's all, you know, the primary author uh, is Professor Bakrin. She has several publications to her credit. And if you go to ResearchGate and log in and look at the RG score, she has very high RG score. That shows that her work is quoted, re-quoted, and published again and again. Uh, she is an excellent orator, great scientist, and a good friend of ours. She's also in the mentor and mentor uh, group of uh, ISSP who devises uh, various module in the PIPAC. Uh, she's an expert in the field of PIPAC as well as HIPEC. And she's one of the main investigators who is now analyzing the global role of PIPAC in ovarian cancer uh, along with a group of people. And she's gonna come up with the final result and analysis. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Bakrin for accepting uh, our invitation. I know there are tough times and the blackout there. Uh, I think the way that would happen is uh, they would run your presentation and uh, you can uh, actually you know, give an audio through your phone. And whenever you want to move the next slide, please uh, tell Dave so he would move it. Uh, is that okay? So Dave, can you please run the presentation? Over to you, Professor Bakrin. Thank you very much for accepting again. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm very uh, glad you give me the opportunity. I have uh, some troubleshoot with my uh, uh, with my internet connection. So I will do my best and I'm trying to be quick to give you my message uh, to talk about the emerging role of PIPAC in ovarian cancer. And it's a very exciting uh, uh, topic uh, because the PIPAC is a new, uh, it's a new technique. And uh, indeed, I think that uh, ovarian cancer is, um, a, is a wide field of uh, research uh, for, uh, for, for PIPAC. So so next, uh, you all know that uh, epithelial ovarian cancer is not, it's, we can't consider it as a rare cancer, but um, there's a lot of death uh, every year. And you know that uh, even if you give to the patient the best surgery, um, the best surgery with no, with, uh, no tumor, um, um, uh, perfect surgeries, uh, sorry, and the sixth cycle of chemotherapy will recur within five years, and this will be uh, a problem to treat, uh, to treat them uh, afterward. Uh, fortunately, the natural history of uh, the ovarian cancer is mostly peritoneal, and this makes it uh, perfectly uh, suitable for local regional uh, approach. Um, next one. So a uh, PIPAC, I think that everybody know what is PIPAC here in the in the audience. Um, uh, PIPAC, it's only a chemotherapy. I think we don't have to compare it to HIPAC of, um, uh, of, 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 of a very last set of the surgery, uh, whereas PIPAC is the repeated uh, uh, IP uh, chemotherapy. The standard procedure for PIPAC is as follows. The patient is under general anesthesia, we uh, put uh, two trucker that are inserted uh, in the midline, and then we, uh, we, we do a capnoperitoneum that is maintained with uh, 12 millimeter of, um, with 12 millimeter, and then we, we put a nebulizer and the laparoscope uh, in each trucker. And maybe we can use a third trucker if we have some, uh, some trouble or some uh, technical uh, difficult cases. Uh, then we explore the, uh, the, the abdomen. Once we have uh, described the peritoneal arcasimatosis to the PCI, we may uh, have uh, a BOC if needed. And then, then we inject through um, a high pressure line uh, the chemotherapy. So this is uh, the way uh, we give uh, we give PIPAC to, uh, to to our patients, and this technique is repeated through a particular agenda, uh, considering the the, the uh, considering the the, the the disease. Next, uh, next, uh, next one. So you can say that um, 
IT is not a new idea. It's not an, it's not a new way to give uh, to give chemotherapy, and we uh, perfectly know IP in ovarian cancer, particularly in adjuvant setting, and we know that IPC uh, uh, were uh, proven to improve PFS and OS. So uh, I give you this very uh, this well known Cochrane uh, review uh, concerning IP, uh, and we, we you can see that there is. Um, an improvement of PFS uh, and uh, and uh, an improvement of OS for a patient with ovarian cancer, but the real problem in uh, in IP was uh, the GI toxicity, the pain, the fever, and the catheter related complication that made um, IP uh, not be uh, a standard treatment, uh, even if uh, there was uh, a benefit for uh, for patients. So uh, considering this data, we could just um, ask what, what is the, the benefit, the advantage um, of, uh, of uh, PIPAC uh, uh, compared to, to, to IP. Next one. So the difference, you can see it on, on, the, next, uh, uh, on the next dia. Uh, when you give uh, IP, you don't have a high concentration of chemotherapy. And this is a photography of the, the abdomen of a pig. Uh, next. You can see the difference between IP distribution and PIPAC distribution. Since in PIPAC, chemotherapy is not diluted. And then it is given with a high concentration and it is um, it, it presents uh, a, a better distribution uh, compared to uh, to to IP chemotherapy. However, the last studies that was uh, that were published uh, in PIPAC show that. Uh, even if uh, the distribution is better than IP uh, than IP chemo, uh, there is a heterogeneous distribution of, of uh, the penetration of doxorubicin. We see that the nebulizer uh, than in tissues that are um, located in the opposite top or sidewall after PIPAC. Uh, anyway, uh, PIPAC has a better distribution than uh, than uh, than IP. Next. Uh, in the in the in the next dia, you can see uh, the the view of the distribution of a blue colorant uh, given uh, by uh, the nebulizer, and this is a view of the laparoscopy, and you can see that every uh, part of uh, the abdomen, uh, the, the the peritoneal wall, um, and the organ are quite homogeneously. Um, uh, there is a quite homogeneous uh, distribution of, uh, of, of the chemotherapy. And this um, uh, perioperative consultation, uh, we can uh, have a confirmation of this, uh, uh, of this efficacy, of this um, biological uh, efficacy, uh, when we look at the tissue penetration. Uh, next, since the, 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 the penetration of the chemotherapy when it is given by PIPAC is up to seven layers, that is uh, uh, far, uh, that is better than HIPAC and better than the control. Maybe um, I think that that, uh, that results are due to the fact that PIPAC is distributed with a high pressure, uh, whether um, compared to HIPAC, that in, in most of teams, HIPAC is given uh, according to an open procedure, so without, uh, without any pressure. Uh, anyway, PIPAC uh, uh, allow a better penetration of chemotherapy uh, inside, uh, inside the tissue. Next. If uh, we look at the um, chemotherapy uh, regimen, um, uh, actually um, the, the team that practice uh, that, that practice PIPAC all over the world uh, try to have a very uh, homogeneous practice and not to fall in the pitfall uh, that uh, we felt in uh, in HIPEC with a very heterogeneous uh, um, um, uh, protocols. So uh, we all try to uh, to give the same protocol to our patients and. Uh, uh, 
uh, the, the last one, um, next, uh, next DIA, uh, is based on the BIPAC OV2 prospective open phase one dose escalation uh, that concluded that it was safe to give uh, cisplatinum a B therapy with cisplatinum 10.5. Uh, milligram per meter square and doxorubicin 2.1 milligram per meter square. Even if there is some heterogeneity among the team that practice a BIPAC, I think that uh, most of us use uh, either this protocol, either the, 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 the previous one that was cisplatinum 7.5 and doxorubicin 1.5. Uh, so uh, this is uh, for uh, the, the, BIPAC, uh, the BIPAC protocol. Next one. If we look to um, the safety and the feasibility uh, of, uh, of BIPAC, we can um, we have 14 studies uh, uh, that can be uh, uh, looked at. Uh, we have up to 70% of non-access rates. Uh, since we um, usually treat patients that have already been operated on, uh, this raises a, a concern um, uh, concerning the, the, the ability to, to, to give them the laparoscopy to access to their abdomen. Uh, historically, we say that uh, uh, there was about 70% uh, of patients that can't, couldn't have the BIPAC uh, because of a non-access uh, uh, of, uh, of non-access. But um, uh, the more the team are trained, and the less um, and, and the less we have to face up with um, uh, with non-access laparoscopy. So I think that uh, for trained teams, we are about to 5% of non-access rate, uh, rather than 70%. So um, um, there are some grade three uh, to five uh, toxicity from 17 to 33 uh, persons. Uh, it, may, it may appear a lot high, but uh, we will see uh, uh, later in the presentation that um, uh, there is, they are not, it is nothing to, 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 to it's quite different from uh, the toxicity of, uh, of surgery in high tech. Um, and the mortality in some uh, in, in some articles are reported to be uh, up to six point eight percent, and this this has to be put in perspective that uh, most of this uh, of this um, of these studies uh, we treat. Uh, we treat patients in palliative intent. So um, uh, we have to keep this in mind that uh, when there are mortality, we have to keep in mind that some of the patients were treated in, uh, in palliative intent. Next one. Uh, concerning PIPAC and ovarian cancer, if we check all the, all the literature, we can see that more than two-thirds of the patients with ovarian cancer uh, are treated for recurrence, uh, probably because uh, uh, this uh, subgroup of patients um, uh, don't have standard treatment, and mostly uh, they present platinum-resistant uh, uh, recurrence uh, with the well-known uh, poor outcome uh, we, all, uh, we all have to, to, to face with. Uh, concerning the clinical efficacy, I only um, I, I will only talk about the PCI and the pathologic response, because uh, when we uh, when we read all the literature about PIPAC and ovarian cancer, I don't think that the uh, overall survival on the PFS uh, uh, can be. Uh, can be interpreted uh, because there are small series or there are retrospective series. That for, 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 uh, in the beginning, we have to focus on the clinical efficacy, but on the macroscopic and the pathologic response. Uh, in TEMFOR 2015, uh, the number 2425, you can see that there is an improvement of the peritoneal carcinomatosis um, rated through the PCI that is uh, between 15 to 75 percent. And when we focus on the pathologic response, we can see uh, uh, response between 15 to 70 percent of uh, the, the of, uh, improvement of the pathologic response. This pathologic response include the complete response, uh, the stable disease, and the partial response. 
So this may be seen as promising results, but we don't know if this is uh, if this is produced uh, by a better OS or a better uh, PFS. These are, uh, for the next uh, dia, uh, we can see the intraoperative, for the intraoperative finding. Uh, when we perform two or three uh, PIPAC uh, in, in patients, uh, these are the, 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 the aspects that we face up uh, once we have performed the laparoscopy. Uh, next dia, please. So uh, these are uh, the laparoscopy before the first, before the second, and before the third pressure ride, uh, uh, before the third pie pack. And you can see that there, what appear is the sclerosis um, uh, of the peritoneal nodule. Uh, and we can see that the nodule uh, shrink from the first to uh, the third, uh, to third uh, pie pack. Uh, let's go to the quality of life. So this was the intraoperative finding, uh, real sclerosis of the of the tumor, and then the the, the quality of, the, of life. Uh, in a palliative intent, uh, pi pack seems to be uh, able to maintain or improve uh, the quality of life of patients with uh, peritoneal carcinomatosis, and particularly in patients uh, at uh, at uh, end stage. And we can see in particular that the gastro gastrointestinal function uh, through nausea, vomiting, loss of appetite, diarrhea uh, did better in uh, in uh, through uh, through PIPAC. And uh, there, there is no deterioration of the physical or the emotional um, uh, function. So this has to be kept in mind uh, because if we consider uh, this uh, particular subgroup, subgroup uh, of ovarian cancer that are in palliative intent, um, uh, the, the fact that the quality of life is uh, improved or at least stable um, is um, uh, is a good point for uh, is a good point for PIPAC. Next, uh, next uh, dia. So for in the next uh, uh, in the next slide, uh, I just wanted to focus on the um, uh, the epithelial ovarian cancer and the way it responds to uh, chemotherapy. Uh, first, uh, you, you can see that I don't evaluate, I don't assess the number of uh, upfront surgery because uh, all surgeons and oncologists know that the rate of frontline surgery is not all about the resectability. It depends more on the surgeon, on the center culture. And that's why I focus on the patient with neoadjuvant therapy, whatever the rational is. You can see that if you take into account 100 patients that you treat with chemotherapy first, 15% of the patient will receive will will receive three chemotherapy and respond enough uh, to uh, to to go to the surgery, and then they will they will be given three more chemotherapy. So there are the good responder, the one who respond enough to be uh, to be operated on. And then there are 45% uh, of patients that do receive three cycle of chemotherapy, that do respond, but the, uh, the, their response is not enough to give, uh, to, give them, uh, uh, to give them surgery. And so they don't have a resectable disease, so they go on three more chemotherapy. This subset of patients uh, is, I think, uh, a group of patients we, we have to, to, to find them some solution for treat them better because we don't know if we operated on after six cycles of chemotherapy, is this surgery um, will give them a benefit uh, on, on survival or not. I think there are not up to date uh, strong data on, uh, on this. And finally, there are 5% of patients that have a refractory disease, and these have a very, very poor outcome. There is not a lot of solution uh, for, uh, for these patients. So um, if we focus, uh, next slide, 
uh, if we focus on uh, the platinum resistant recurrence, you know that they have um, a very poor outcome. Uh, 6.7 months since uh, the Aurelia uh, protocol, and for the OS, it's almost less than, uh, than one year. So they are treated with a single agent chemotherapy with non-platinum drugs, so they are not challenged another, another, another time with uh, platinum. And uh, we know that the combi combination of additional agents doesn't offer any advantage for this, uh, for this subgroup of patients. The addition of uh, bevacizumab uh, in the Aurelia protocol increased the PFS, but with a high risk of complication. So there is no guideline uh, recommendation for a single regimen. And most, uh, uh, most of the time, uh, the therapeutic decision is left to the physician. We always say best physician choice. So it's a, it's a population of ovarian cancer with a very poor, uh, uh, a very poor uh, uh, outcome. If we consider the second, the third, and the fourth recurrence, uh, I have cleared the first recurrence because with the Olaparib and the new treatment, um, uh, the, the, the outcome had radically changed and improved. But if we considered the third and the fourth uh, recurrence, uh, the, we can see that the outcome dropped uh, with, uh, with uh, the more there are recurrences and the more the outcome drops and the response of the chemotherapy uh, uh, drop also. Um, uh, next, uh, next slide. So you can see for the third recurrence, uh, nine months, and for fourth the recurrence, five months. And if we consider the survival, you can see that the PFS gain is only 3.5 months for the patient receiving relapse treatment, both in third and fourth line therapy, compared with patients without any treatment. Say, I, I don't say that um, chemotherapy isn't useful. I think that uh, chemotherapy is, uh, is absolutely necessary uh, in ovarian cancer, that the higher line of subsequent systemic treatments may be less beneficial for the patients and uh, may, be, may be also more toxic for patients that have already been challenged, uh, uh, whose uh, bone marrow had already, already been challenged with the um, previous line of chemotherapy. So all this, um, uh, all, all this data has to be taken into account count when we consider treatment for this subgroup of patients with a poor, with a poor outcome. Um, next, uh, next slide. If we focus on the clinical endpoint on, um, uh, on, on the, 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 the patient reported outcome uh, that are a growing interest in our field of research, we can see that when they are asked for um, their opinion considering a new agent, they think that to be meaningful, the minimum extension of PFS and OS should be five months according to women with, with uh, ovarian cancer. And they are willing to accept a shorter PFS to avoid severe side effects. This is very important, particularly in the third and the fourth um, uh, recurrence and uh, they, they, they are prepared to accept a higher toxicity only if they are promised to have a longer, a longer OS. And this point of view is very important to uh, build our future, uh, our future clinical trial and to uh, respond uh, to answer uh, to, the, to, to the need of, uh, of, uh, of our patients. Uh, next slide. Uh, I wanted to focus on the, the PIPAC OV1 safety. PIPAC OV1 is, um, uh, is a phase two trial uh, of PIPAC in ovarian in patient with ovarian cancer, recurrent and platinum resistance. And I wanted to focus on the type of, uh, of, uh, of toxicity. Because when we uh, talk about the toxicity of PIPAC, you can see that indeed you have grade two and grade three toxicity, but uh, uh, this kind of, uh, of toxicity is mostly abdominal pain. It's um, uh, a bowel obstruction, but uh, uh, transient bowel obstruction, uh, sometimes intraoperative bleeding, 
and most of the complications are uh, inflammatory due to uh, to 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 IP uh, to the IP chemotherapy. So even if uh, I told you that there was 33% of grade three and four toxicity in PIPAC, it's uh, definitely not the same uh, complication that we see in surgery and high pack. Unfortunately, it's not the same because it's not the same population. When we consider surgery in high pack, it is with the curative intent, while when we consider um, a PIPAC, we at this stage of our knowledge, uh, we consider it only in a palliative intent or at least not in a curative intent. Uh, next slide. So, uh, in my opinion, what are the PIPAC perspective? What we can say is that um, there are three groups of patients that have their therapeutic needs that are not met. The platinum resistant recurrence that that don't have any standard uh, unless the monochemotherapy. Uh, the higher relapse um, for third on, third on more. And I give also um, uh, uh, a rule for PIPAC in the non resectable disease, because for these patients that maybe uh, would, would benefit from uh, a surgery, I think that it may have. It, it may be a place, uh, a role for PIPAC uh, to, in, to intensify uh, intraoperationally uh, the, the treatment and, and to, to make this patient being good candidate for, uh, for surgery. So I would say there are three populations, non-resectable disease, platinum resistant recurrence and third relapse that would be good, um, uh, good candidate uh, for the PIPAC, uh, the PIPAC perspective. And indeed, when we focus only on the trial that address uh, ovarian cancer, because there are a lot of trial in, in PIPAC uh, and ovarian cancer, but also when they are, they are melt with other peritoneal carcinomatosis uh, etiology, uh, there is PAYROT, that is a phase one, two, that address uh, the patient with peritoneal cancer uh, with um, with ovarian cancer, with the, the uh, recurrence, uh, platinum resistant recurrence. Um, and there is the PIPACOVA, uh, that is a phase one trial uh, that uh, address the patients that are not resectable after three cycles of uh, chemotherapy, uh, and uh, that uh, will be intensified, will we'll have an IP intensification with PIPAC to uh, make them resectable after uh, three more, three more cycles. Next, uh, next slide. I think that there is also a place in PIPAC for patients for elderly, uh, patients that have more than 75 uh, years and also for the comorbidity. If you look to this uh, very interesting study of the German quality assurance program uh, that look at uh, the, the, the outcome of patients that have ovarian cancer, you can see that uh, considering the 75 years and more and considering the patient with comorbidity and considering both, it's to say 75 years plus comorbidity, these patients, next, uh, uh, next please, uh, these patients represent uh, more than about 12% of all patients. So it is a huge amount of patients uh, that are not given the complete treatment. And moreover, next, if you focus on uh, the survival, you can see that at three months, there is a mortality rate of 30%. And at six months, there is a mortality rate of 40%. And this is the results for this 12% uh, percent of patients that are treated with the actual standard. It's to say chemotherapy and surgery. And maybe we have to think about an alternative to this patient that uh, obviously uh, the standards are not fit for, uh, they are not fit for the standards. If they, if they control, they are not fit for the standards. Uh, next slide. So if we complete, I think that the PIPAC perspective, we can distinguish 
uh, four population uh, for which uh, there are non-met therapeutic needs, the non-resectable disease, and maybe we could imagine that uh, there is a place for a combined IV and IP therapeutic. The platinum resistant recurrence maybe uh, to, um, to uh, make them hospital since BIPAC is given every six, uh, six, uh, six weeks. Uh, so platinum resistant rec recurrence could be given exclusively a uh, pipac, but all this uh, all this suggestion has to be assessed uh, inside uh, uh, inside a trial, uh, maybe for the third and more relapse. And I think that the uh, elderly uh, are a ideal population uh, to uh, study pipac, the effect and the efficacy of pipac uh, in. So um, thank you uh, very much for your attention. I hope that um, uh, uh, you hear me, uh, you have heard me clearly, and uh, I give you the, the main message I wanted to. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Bakrin. That was a wonderful, excellent uh, evidence-based talk. Uh, the concepts uh, and the way forward, uh, which has been explained and put by you are outstanding. Uh, I know that uh, you are just presiding over the data of all the pipex done in ovarian cancer globally. And in the next uh, couple of months, you're going to come with a publication. We are eagerly waiting for that. Personal thank you uh, in these difficult times, uh, you know, when you had a blackout there and when you had a lot of technical problem, you could really do everything fantastically through your mobile. Yeah.